The metaverse is emerging as the next big technology platform and promises to be the next frontier for human experiences on the internet. Into the Metaverse covers companies, technologies, and trends that are bringing these promises to life. Join creator and host Jonathan Ross Friedman, founder and CEO of SuperSocial, as he interviews the brilliant minds that are building, shaping, and investing in the Metaverse. Welcome to Into the Metaverse, where we help make sense of the Metaverse through deep interviews with the brilliant minds who build, create for, and invest in the Metaverse. I'm Jan, and joining me today is Louis Rosenberg, PhD, a pioneer in fields of augmented reality, virtual reality, and artificial intelligence. He earned his PhD from Stanford, has been awarded over 300 patents for VR, AR, and AI technologies, and founded a number of successful companies, including Unanimous AI, Immersion Corporation, Microscribe, and Outland Research. Among Lewis's accomplishments, the first one at the Air Force Research Laboratory in the early 90s, Lewis created the first functional augmented reality system. It's known as Virtual Fixtures Platform and enabled users to interact with a mixed reality of real and virtual objects for the very first time. He also founded the VR company Immersion Corp. in 1993 and brought the company public in 1999. Immersion pioneered many technologies from the first VR simulators for medical schools to the first haptic devices for consumer markets, including the first haptic mice and joysticks and touchscreens. And then he also founded Microscribe, which is a maker of 3D digitizers used in the production of video games and feature films, including major 3D films such as Shrek, Ice Age, and Bug Life all-time favorites. And most recently, Lewis founded Unanimous AI to amplify the intelligence of networked human groups using the biological principle of swarm intelligence. The idea panned out, resulting in swarm AI, an award-winning technology used by a wide range of organizations from Fortune 500 corporations to the United Nations. This is a whole topic in and of itself, so we're not going to dig too much about that, although I'm sure there's going to be an element of AI we want to cover today. Louis, really delighted to welcome you on to the Metaverse. Yeah, thanks for having me. So as always, just a disclaimer, everything discussed on the podcast is not a financial advice. Content is strictly educational. Let's dig in. So Louis, as we continue to build an evolving consensus around what the Metaverse is, the first question I like to ask every guest on the podcast is for you, what is the metaverse? And no less important, what do you believe it's not? There's lots of people define the metaverse in different ways. I feel like most definitions are actually confusing because they end up relying on very specific technologies that maybe are going to be implemented uh, in the near term, but they're not really thinking long term. I, you know, very often, whatever technology happens to, to be trendy at the moment gets dragged into to definitions. And uh, so I like to actually keep it very simple and high level and really think about it in terms of the user. What does it mean to people? And so to me, the metaverse is really the large scale societal transition from a world that's currently based on flat media viewed in the third person to a world that will be largely based on immersive experiences engaged in the first person. And I really think it's that simple that our digital lives, our digital worlds will go from flat media to immersive media. It sounds simple, but it actually changes everything because it changes the role of the user, it changes the role of the user from an observer on the outside to a participant on the inside. And it's also, I like to think of it as a very humanizing step. And I think it's important to say that because for a lot of people, they see when they think of the metaverse or see images of the metaverse, what they really see is somebody wearing a headset, maybe hand controllers, it looks very um, non-human. <laughs> and so I think it's important to express that at its core, really the reason why I got involved in the metaverse you know, over 30 years ago, the reason that I've been excited about this technology is because it's humanizing. And by humanizing, I mean the, the whole purpose of this transition from flat media to immersive experiences is to present information to people in the form that our perceptual system was meant to receive it. Not by looking through little windows at content, but by engaging content in our natural environments, in our world all around us. And that, that step will allow us to better understand and interact with our digital world. You're touching on a really important point in every new technological era, 
we people in general get so bogged down and focused on the tech. The tech is so exciting. The tech is so cool, right? And it happens now with VR. Well, VR, it's been going on with VR for quite a long time. This is not the first time that we've been dreaming about that all-purpose headsets that we put on our head and it takes us to a new realm. And it's so easy to get bogged down with the technology and forgetting that at the end of the day, the people use technology. Technology is only relevant because people use it to do something. They do it to be entertained. They do it to socialize. They do it to play. They do it to consume content. They do it to work, right? And I think that the exciting part and where I think there's still a lot of evidence to be actually put forward is what are those applications, those consumer experiences, business experiences or applications that are going to actually translate the promise of a metaverse into action and demystify what it all means. Potentially, even by the time the metaverse actually becomes a widespread thing, maybe we're still just going to call it the internet, right? And so really appreciate the context and giving your point of view. And so I'd love to really, now that we've put that definition aside, I'd love to dig deeper on your, really your multi-year work in advanced immersive technologies. And my first question on that would be, what have you learned throughout the years about the value add, so to speak, that immersive technologies can provide either to people or businesses or both? Yeah. So, I mean, for me as a technologist, the interesting thing is that the pieces that are, that I learn always come from people rather than from the technology. And I was fortunate in that I got involved in the technology really way back at the beginning and was able to do fundamental research that required a lot of human testing because I learned the most from the humans who would respond. And so the, you know, the earliest work I did was at Stanford and NASA in 1991, working on early vision systems for virtual reality. And those vision systems were certainly much simpler than they are today in terms of just their fidelity and their ability to generate quality images. And they had issues around lag. And in fact, my work at NASA in 91 was to look at uh, basic software issues about how you model interocular distance to optimize depth perception. And so I was working on this you know, fundamental issue of how do you improve depth perception? And I'd have human users come through and try things and try to optimize their depth perception. And every single one would finish the experiment and say, wow, this is amazing. Like this, you know, one day this technology is going to be everywhere. And I would talk to them and say, well, why? So, well, you know, I could interact with the, with content as if it's real. And so fundamentally that sounds simple, but it really, it's just about presenting information to users in the way that we're meant to perceive it. And when you really think about it that way, it improves everything. Meaning when we can interact with, with digital content in natural ways where things are spatially arranged around us, we can make use of our natural forms of intuition and understanding. And we can get, instead of looking at a picture of something, we can be immersed next to it. We can get a sense of its true scale. We can shrink ourselves down to tiny levels and get a sense of molecules and atoms in a very spatial way that allows us to build intuition. We can expand ourselves very large and get a sense of, of galactic things in terms of scale. And so the point of the technology is to bring ourselves into an information space and allow ourselves to make use of all of our natural abilities, as opposed to looking at flat content, which is really an abstraction of the information, and then thinking about it in the abstract. And so that was the first fundamental thing that I learned. The other thing I learned actually during my very early work at NASA with vision systems, which is that you have to really think about what people want rather than what technologists want. And the feedback that, that I felt when I was working in virtual environments for long periods of time writing software and that the test subjects would give me feedback about was that people really liked the virtual world, but they didn't like to be cut off from the real world. And people, you know, often forget this, meaning just because something is good doesn't mean you want to lose something else that's also good. The real world is also part of how we understand our world. And so that feedback was really what inspired me to say what I would really 
like to do, and what I really think the metaverse should be, is the real world embellished with virtual content. What I really wanted to do while I was working at NASA was to say, hey, can we take advantage of all these things, but just put it all around us in the real world? I was fortunate enough to pitch that to the U.S. Air Force, and they funded me to build one of the very first augmented reality systems, and really the first system that allowed people to reach out and interact with real and virtual objects at the same time. And again, I was able to bring in lots of human subjects to, to try things and feel things. And the reaction was, one day, this is going to be how we interact with the world. And so when the technology was simpler and people were just even hearing about it for the first time 30 years ago, the reaction from the average person off the street was, one day, this is going to be how we interact with with digital content. Now, I personally thought that one day would be about 10 years later. So I thought around 1999, 2000 is when, you know, virtual and augmented reality would be ubiquitous. That's why I founded a virtual reality company in 1993. Uh, and it's taken 30 years instead of 10 years. But I feel like we really are there this time, that the metaverse is actually really on the cusp of happening. And again, it's the fundamental issue before you even think about what's the killer app, how is it going to be used in this place or that place, the fundamental issue is this is the way humans were meant to interact with information. And what I like to say is that it's both virtual and augmented. And I personally think that augmented reality is going to be the metaverse that most of us interact with because it brings the power of virtual reality without cutting you off from the real world. And in that context, I think that in 10 years from now, we will look back at movies of today and see people walking down the street, staring at a phone, bumping into things, and think like, wow, that used to be how people interacted with the digital world, as opposed to the content just being around you. That's just the way it should be, because that's how we perceive information. And I think that's the fundamental, most important reason why the, whether it takes five years or 10 years or 15 years, that's the fundamental reason why it will happen. There's no question because that's just the way that content and information should be presented to our perceptual system. It's fantastic to get the context from <clears throat> someone like yourself who has been in the forefront of these technologies for the past 30 years. And I do share the deterministic approach of this is just the way it's going to happen. I think ultimately where the rubber meets the road is to see the what meaningful applications and experiences people can interact with, right, to really make it valuable. It's like you know, BlackBerry created a proof point that people do want to interact with smartphones, but they didn't create something that 5 billion people wanted to interact. And the technology was not yet there in a way that enabled widespread mobile technology to be available. And then the iPhone came on the back of the technology and you're talking about timing, right? You were 20 years ahead of your time. Apple nailed it with the smartphone. And it does feel like, broadly speaking, immersive technologies are really starting to become more relevant. And I know there is the sort of uproar in a way about Meta's new MetaQuest Pro that costs $1,500, but those $1,500 probably 10, 20 years ago would have been 25, 30, maybe even $50,000. And so we definitely made a long way with the computing power, the computational components, et cetera, et cetera. One thing that I'm interested in getting your perspective on is what are some of the core initial use cases that you envisioned as a builder and as an entrepreneur ago when you started your company 30 years ago that you believe today are actually much more relevant to be manifested through the technology? Sure. When I founded my first company, Immersion Corporation, which was 1993, the goal was to bring virtual reality and augmented reality to the world. As you mentioned, Everything was much more expensive back then. The hardware was more expensive in terms of vision systems and things, but also just the basic computing power was more expensive. In order to do a real virtual environment back then, you needed a silicon graphics workstation, which could have costed between thirty to $60,000. And back in the early days, the first technology areas that, that I focused on commercially was for medicine. And it's not because... People in the medical field have some unique benefits that they can get out of virtual worlds that people in engineering can't get. It's because people in the medical field um, can afford a more expensive 
platforms. <laughs> and so that was the reason why we focused on that space. And the very first products that we developed and really started displaying commercially in 1995 were virtual reality medical simulators for training doctors to perform, to learn surgical procedures. And so we built virtual reality systems for teaching doctors to perform laparoscopic surgery and endoscopic surgery and catheter insertion and bronchoscopy. These systems, we built the interfaces with full haptic feedback so that when doctors practiced these, these procedures, they could actually feel the engagement. It turns out that for the medical training, that the you know, quality haptic feedback was actually more important than quality visual representations because they're trying to learn a manual skill. They're trying to develop dexterity. And so we worked really hard to develop a really high quality, realistic haptic feedback. And these simulators, we started selling these simulators to medical schools in uh, 1996, 1997, and continued selling for decades. Immersion is actually is still around today. It's going to turn 30 years old next year. I left in 2002 and founded an augmented reality company out and research, but Immersion continued to build and develop and sell medical simulators, get into other markets. And those products, they sold off that division to another company, but those products are still around today for teaching doctors to perform these procedures. And it convinced me that this works. And it convinced me it works in a kind of a funny way, which is that back in 95, 96, 97, I would go to a lot of trade shows, medical trade shows and show people, hey, look how you could learn to do a bronchoscopy in virtual reality. And so you're holding onto this medical instrument and you're guiding it down into the bronchial tubes and steer, steering around we're using a real medical, you're holding onto a real medical instrument, performing the surgery. And I would give demos again and again and again. And eventually I'd have people come up to me and say, go to medical school, are you a doctor? Because I had gotten actually skilled at doing the procedure just by giving the demos. And that's really the whole point is that I didn't have to, I didn't have to actually engage any real patients. I could be in a completely safe environment, just like somebody in a flight simulator could be in a safe environment. And I could practice and learn to perform these sophisticated medical procedures. And at the same time, I actually learned the anatomy of the body because I was going through and seeing things and these medical simulators, because they are simulators. You're not just in virtual reality doing it exactly like it's real, but it was giving feedback. Where did you go wrong? Did you go too slow? Did you forget a step? And use of virtual reality for training, whether it's training doctors or training people to repair aircraft or training people to perform anything, I think extremely powerful. And as the technology gets less and less expensive, the range of things that you could use it for training goes up and then it goes to just mainstream education. I personally think that education will ultimately be a profoundly application of virtual and augmented reality, primarily because in a virtual reality, you can immerse yourself into content that looks and feels and sounds real and gain an intuitive understanding whether it's historical content and you're going back into the past or scientific content, shrinking yourself down to a size that you couldn't normally experience. And you can do it with classmates or with an instructor. An instructor can take you on a tour of the body inside the human body. And that will happen. And that people will realize that you can learn things in ways that you couldn't do with just a lecture or a book. You can learn things in ways that give you intuitive understanding I definitely want to connect what you just explained to the point earlier you've made around the connection between physical and virtual. I think another sort of misconception about the metaverse to a large extent, because one company turned on the light, quote unquote, on what is the metaverse in October last year, which is Facebook changing their name to meta and suddenly Oh, the metaverse is about a virtual reality device, which on the one hand was great that we've turned on the light on the concept, theoretically for the entire world. But on the other side, it became very focused on what meta is doing and it's about virtual reality, et cetera, et cetera, which I think we're kind of slowly but gradually getting out of that misconception. I actually wrote a few months ago a piece on our blog, which is called The Real and the Unreal. Because I do believe in your worldview that not only augmented reality or playing, kind of explaining the layering digital content over, over physical world, that obviously is way more attractive from a human experience perspective than putting a headset on our head 
and disconnecting ourselves from the physical world. There will be use cases for that. There's definitely a place for virtual reality per se as a pure form factor in certain use cases where that would make sense. I think of virtual reality almost like game consoles, right? It's going to be a more niche population. It will be big enough to build great businesses, but it's not going to be the smartphone. Virtual reality headsets are not going to replace the smartphone. Quite the opposite. The smartphone will likely continue to be brain of all of those different technologies like augmented reality, virtual reality, and still being able to use the smartphone form factor almost as a hub, as a connecting tissue between all of those things. And so I think it's important to highlight again your point that the real potential of augmenting digital content over reality and then making sure that there is a connecting tissue between the two. And so if I immerse myself in a virtual world in 3D and I have an identity and I purchase thing, it would be much more meaningful if that is somehow connected to my real life identity. And so there isn't that sort of parallel universes that are emerging that are disjointed and disconnected. And I think that's part of what people talk about an interoperable metaverse and making sure that it's open and collaborative and it's an ecosystem that is inclusive. I'd like to use that as a springboard to get your perspective on what happens if we get the metaverse wrong. So first, just a quick comment on what you said, which is I, I fully agree that uh, the, the metaverse will be both virtual and augmented. And I am fairly convinced that the metaverse that we will be thinking about in the future is an augmented world where we embellish our world with content. I do think that the virtual metaverse, and I like to refer to it as a virtual metaverse and augmented metaverse, just to make it clear, I think the virtual metaverse will be increasingly popular. I think it'll be used for things that people are happy to engage for a few hours at a time. But more than that, it's not going to be what they interact with from the time they wake up in the morning to the time they go to sleep at night. Uh, the augmented metaverse will. And you know, the, the virtual metaverse will be great for socializing and gaming and shopping and some business experiences and educational experiences. But if it's purely virtual, no one's going to want to do it for extended period. You just, you can't, people don't want to be cut off from their world. It's a basic physiological thing, <laughs> but you could provide just as impactful and authentic educational experiences and shopping experiences in an augmented world where, again, you're not leaving your space, but you are bringing in the virtual content and that will be the evolution of the smartphone. And again, the smartphone is what people use from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to sleep. When augmented reality reaches that level, then that will be the metaverse where your life is an augmented world embellished with spatially registered immersive content. And so I think that's the world that I visualize when I think of the, the metaverse. And to get to your second point about, okay, what happens if we get it wrong? I speak and write often about the dangers of the metaverse. I do that as somebody who really believes in the technology, but I also have been involved for long enough that I can see the dangers. And I think the dangers are very significant. It's not the technology itself that I'm concerned about. It's the extreme power that metaverse platforms could potentially have over the lives of consumers by virtue of the technology itself. The metaverse will give platforms, uh, certain entities that are in position, levels of power to basically watch what everybody's doing in the world and adjust the world around them for potentially promotional purposes. And it's worth digging into that because the dangers there are actually pretty extreme. And it's also worth comparing it to say social media because we've, at least this point, we can think of social media as a technology that when it emerged 10, 15 years ago, it was generally viewed as a utopian technology, all kinds of positive uses that social media will bring the world together, it will give a voice to people who don't have a voice, it will enhance democracy and all kinds of things. And then the way the industry evolved, the, uh, the large, powerful platforms developed business models that really their business model is really about tracking and profiling their users so that they can then sell 
targeted influence to sponsors. It's good to think of social media as a comparison because social media is a technology that 10, 15 years ago when it kicked off, we all thought of it as a utopian technology that will bring the world together, give a voice to people who don't have a voice, be a democratizing technology. And it really is all those things. But at the same time, we know that there's a lot of really negative things that happened. And what happened really wasn't because of the technology itself. What, what happened was that the, the large platforms developed business models that drove things in a certain direction. And so the social media business models right now are really focused on tracking and profiling their users so they can then sell targeted influence to third-party sponsors of those users. And that business model that's really focused on targeting and tracking and profiling and then in injecting into the user's uh, life uh, sponsored advertisements and targeted news feeds to increase engagement has created all these unforeseen problems. It has created a polarization of societies. It's contributed to the spread of disinformation and misinformation. And none of those things were predicted. The companies that are responsible aren't evil. They developed a business model that made business sense, but through competition, it drove them to become the greatest instruments of tracking and profiling and persuasion that humanity has ever seen. To understand and appreciate the dangers of the metaverse, it's good to compare it to social media because social media is a technology where we at least are familiar with unexpected dangers. And if we go back, let's say 10, 15 years to the birth of social media, we really viewed it as a, um, a utopian technology that's going to bring the world together, that's going to give a voice to people who don't have a voice, that's going to help spread democracy. And those positive things are real. And yet now we think of social media as a technology that has been very damaging to society. And we can ask, well, why is it damaging? It's not the technology itself that's damaging. It's actually the business models that emerged from the major platforms that drove that technology into a dangerous direction. They can sell more and more advertisements, and it's created these problems, which are well-documented to have increased polarization of societies, spread misinformation, disinformation, cr created a lot of social upheaval because of business models that, again, aren't evil. These companies aren't evil. They didn't say, okay, what we want to do is create a business that destabilizes society. No, they said we want to create a business that can make money. And back at the early days of social media, People didn't want to pay subscriptions. They, didn't, they were very happy to get free access in exchange for advertising. And we all went down this path where it became this very dangerous and destructive technology where the companies now compete with each other to become the best machines ever created for tracking, profiling, and targeting users. That's their business, and they are experts at it. So now, the metaverse could very easily go down this same path if similar business models are developed. But... The potential danger is infinitely greater. And that's because in social media, when we talk about tracking users, we're talking about tracking where you click, maybe what you buy, who your friends are. And that's a pretty extensive information. That's how you get profiled. In the metaverse, and again, it's both virtual and augmented, uh, real world or the real world augmented or a purely virtual world. In the metaverse, tracking means tracking where you go, tracking what you do, tracking who you're with tracking what you look at, tracking how long your gaze lingers. I could be walking down the street in the real world, an augmented world, or a completely virtual world, and platforms can track what, you know, where do I slow down? What store windows do I look in? How long does my gaze linger on those, uh, on different items? It will know all those things. They'll be able to track my posture and my gait and infer emotional information about me about how I'm reacting in real time. They will be able to monitor my facial expressions, my vocal inflections. We've seen that deployed in the latest devices for Meta can track your facial expressions and your eye motion, potentially your pupil dilation. That can be used to profile and create very detailed information about your emotional responses at every moment in time. Very likely in the metaverse, sometimes will track your vital signs blood pressure, heart rate, respiration rate, uh, all this information will create extensive profiles, both behavioral profiles, knowing exactly where you go and what you do, and emotional profiles, knowing exactly how you react 
to almost every situation. And so these metaverse platforms could know throughout your daily life, potentially from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, everything you do, who you did it with, and exactly how you emotionally felt while you were doing it in every one of those interactions and have this massive database about you. They can then use this information to target you in the most powerful ways ever created. And they will very likely use AI technology to, to do this because they will have these profiles of your behaviors and emotions, and then they'll be able to predict what do they need to inject into the world to aid you in the most optimal ways. And so let's we talk about the persuasion part. You can think of it as marketing or advertising. You can think of it as propaganda. You can think about it as misinformation. But what it is, is targeted promotional material. In the metaverse, advertisements aren't going to be pop-up ads and videos like in social media. They're going to be immersive experiences. That's the whole point. We're shifting from flat media to immersive experiences. And so in the metaverse, advertising will most likely be, I believe, two primary categories virtual product placements and virtual spokespeople. And so virtual product placements are objects and experiences and things that are placed into your world that are intended to aid you about some product or service or message or content. They could look just as real as everything else in the world. In fact, I might not even be able to tell the difference between a virtual product placement and an authentic experience in the virtual world or augmented world. And so you can imagine a virtual product placement example could be like this. I could be walking down a street, a virtual street or a real street that's with augmented reality. And as I walk down the street, maybe I see a, a parked car and I see two people standing in front of the parked car and they're talking about one of the drivers telling the, their friend how they just bought the car and how they love the car and how it has all these great features. And I might just walk by and just hear that and keep walking. And I might think that was just an authentic experience in this world. Those are just other people just like me, and that probably has subconscious influence on me. I might think, oh, that people really like that car. And I might not realize that that was a targeted promotional experience that was injected into my world by a paying sponsor. It was crafted using intelligent algorithms. They chose the specific car based on my profile. They chose the people who are standing out in front of the car their age, their gender, potentially their ethnicity, their hair color, their clothing, their speaking style, everything about that entire situation could have been chosen based on historical data to know what will be most influential on me. And the conversation itself could have been chosen to influence me. And again, if I can't tell the difference between a real experience and a promotional experience, is that advertising or is that deception? Is that predatory? I might think that's just what authentic people believe. And so in the metaverse, advertising has this potential to cross the line into predatory practices, deceptive practices in an extreme way. And it's not because the companies are evil. It's because the whole point of virtual reality and augmented reality is to blur the boundaries between what's real and what's not real. It's to create suspension of disbelief. And so if you now have this medium that can track people and profile people and inject things into their world, change their world, to influence them, and they don't even necessarily know what's real and what's not real, that's very dangerous. And so this first concept of virtual product placements, the next big category I would call virtual spokespeople. Virtual spokespeople are now AI-controlled avatars that will actually engage you in promotional conversation. And so similar situation, but now maybe I'm sitting in an establishment. It could be in a virtual world. It could be in the real world with augmented reality, and I get engaged by somebody who looks and sounds and just as real as any other avatar or person in my space, and they start talking to me about, it could be, again, a new car. They're engaged in a conversation with somebody about a new car, and this avatar that looks like anybody else is controlled by intelligent algorithms. It has an agenda to influence me to want to buy that car has access to a database of my historical information, my likes, my interests, my hobbies. It has a record of my historical interactions with other promotional avatars. So it has this wealth of information in order to craft a very persuasive conversation to draw me in. 
And at the same time, it potentially has the ability to be reading my facial expressions, reading my vocal inflections, reading my blood pressure, reading my heart rate. And it will adjust its tactics in real time based on its perception of my reaction. So if it sees my blood pressure adjust in a certain way, this AI controlled avatar might realize, oh, this person is showing signs of interest when I talk about horsepower and performance and showing less signs of interest when I talk about the styling. And so it will guide the conversation in that way. And so it will hit me with the most persuasive sales pitch that you could imagine. And I might not even know that was a targeted promotional experience. I might, again, just believe that I was having a conversation because I can't tell the difference. And so the use of virtual product placements and virtual spokespeople potentially very dangerous in terms of forms of persuasion. And it's not super dangerous when we think, you know, oh, I might be promoted very skillfully about a new car because the same exact techniques can be used to promote a piece of propaganda, a piece of extreme ideology, promote certain political ideas over other political ideas, spread misinformation, spread disinformation. What the metaverse could ultimately be is the ultimate tool of persuasion that we've ever created. Again, not because the companies are evil, not because anybody wants that to happen, but because an unregulated metaverse without any guardrails in place, these businesses will adopt an advertising business model and their advertising business model will be based on how well can they track and profile their users in order to sell the most persuasive content they can. And that will mean using everything that's available to them. That's not it. That will mean using your facial expressions. That will mean using your blood pressure. And again, like these technologies have, like they have valid uses. Like they're not putting facial tracking in to be evil. They're not going to put blood pressure in to be evil. Their facial tracking is a humanizing technology. It will make avatars more, more human. It's a good thing. But unless there's regulation, unless there's guardrails that say, okay, you can't use that technology to profile people's emotions and build these emotional models that show how they react in every situation, they will do it. And it's not just the types of emotions that a salesperson could see on your face. These AI technologies combined with facial tracking can detect micro expressions that aren't even perceptible to another person. And yet they can detect emotional content, even when you're not trying to convey that content. Same thing with blood pressure. For exercise and health and meditation applications, blood pressure, heart rate, respiration rate, really valuable things for the metaverse to track. But if it's used for advertising, for emotional profiling, really dangerous. Does anybody want to be engaged in a promotional conversation with an avatar that's trying to convince you of something and it's reading your blood pressure in real time and adjusting its tactics? I don't think so. And so I paint this this picture in a dark way because the solution is to put guardrails in place, to put policy regulation in place that says, hey, it's really good if these metaverse platforms can look at your facial expressions, can read your heart rate, but there needs to be guardrails about what they can do with that information, how they can store that information, whether they can profile you with that information, whether they can run AI algorithms on historical data, and whether they can use that information in real time to optimize their persuasive impact. But here is the real issue, right, Lewis? First of all, I do believe, like you, this way or another, the metaverse will alter society. And I think we can be very deterministic about it because the internet has impacted society, right? And we still haven't figured out as individuals, as corporations, and as a democratic society, how to deal with the evolution of the internet in 2D. And when we're talking about an internet that is multidimensional, it will have an even greater impact on people, on businesses, on society. A lot of the things you said in the past five, 10 minutes are the dream of a lot of marketers. They're not bad people, but everything you said, I was like, wow, I think there's probably a lot of people who are going to listen to this episode and are going to be like, <laughs> cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Oh my God, this is exactly the use cases I've been waiting for. Yeah, I want to know everyone's behavior and what you think and what you do. I mean, we already have that. 
Apple with the Apple Watch already controls an insurmountable amount of data on the way our heart functions. Now, there is a lot of good things that can be done with it. I am less optimistic than you about the role of regulation and government for a very simple reason. Not because there aren't capable people in government and in the regulator, because they have a lot of quote unquote low hanging fruit baseline stuff about the internet that they haven't figured out yet. And we're, we're talking about a whole new paradigm of human experience that is multidimensional, multi, multi device, because we're going to access the metaverse or a 3d internet from our phones, consoles, PC, but also I like to say, when we sit in an autonomous vehicle, what do you think we're going to do in this autonomous vehicle? <laughs> we're going to access the internet. What are we going to do? Right. And it's going to be multidimensional, multi-form factor. Everything is going to be touch. And I think another problem is that there are too many people around the world that I suspect are inspired by dystopian movies like Blade Runner, like Ready Player One, like WALL-E. <laughs> where either we are becoming a bunch of lazy humans, like in WALL-E, where we're sitting on those spaceships and all we do is just consume content. Funnily enough, they put a 2D content, right? It's like just a 2D <laughs> screen. So not that pioneering in their perception in that movie. And then in Ready Player One, the world is ruined and the only salvation is by putting a headset on our head with haptic devices. Or in Blade Runner, you go around a really dark dystopian city where the massive billboards are interactive and they're personalized to you. The virtual spokesperson, as you call it, that female virtual spokesperson in downtown in Blade Runner, she talks to you. She's only focused on you as an individual and she knows what you want and she knows what you're thinking. That's why they come up with these specific advertise, advertisements or promotion, uh, promotional offerings in the movie because they know who you are. And I think a lot of people are inspired by those dystopian movies and want to create it. And I think I remember I read a few years ago and I read Ready Player One, the book, that Facebook gave Ready Player One for every new employee that joins, as if that is the world we want to create. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, are you giving it because this is a world not to do or is this the inspiration for what to do? And I think the issue is that at the end of the day, a lot of the measures of success around the world now and probably for a very long time are still tied to capital creation, wealth creation, and people want to make money. And I would like to believe, and I put more bet on certain companies who are going to really care about, and maybe I'm a bit naive, and maybe it's because I'm an entrepreneur myself and you're an entrepreneur, but I believe that companies will have to play a really critical role in enabling a metaverse that is safe, that is trusted, that is prosperous, that is meaningful, and not succumb to just the corporation who want to do harm and only want to monetize eyeballs and our attention and our behaviors and our emotions. Because I don't think that in the next 10 to 20 years, governments will have the actual ability to do something meaningful about it. So Lewis, we've outlined all the possible scenarios and dangers of everything that can go wrong with the metaverse. And this is not the end of the conversation. I'm sure there's going to be more and more items and news and technologies that are going to help the metaverse come to life. And we're going to hold our head and figure out, okay, what do we do with that? But I want to switch gear and spend a bit of time talking about, let's assume the metaverse is happening. The metaverse will come to life this way or another, and it will, as you echoed earlier, is going to merge digital and physical. It's not just going to be this isolated virtual world. It will impact our lives both virtually and also physically. And so let's talk about what do we do with these potential dangers? What are some of the mechanics or frameworks that we can institute either as individuals, as businesses, and even society, politically speaking, what are some of the things that we can do to ensure that the metaverse you described or the dangers that you've outlined do not come to life or could actually be mitigated? Sure. And that's really the most important question. And I think there's a bunch of things that we can do. The first is just raise awareness and create awareness so that people appreciate the potential dangers of the metaverse. And I say that because so many times we see technologies emerge where we can clearly see the utopian possibilities, the industry amplifies the utopian message, 
and people just don't appreciate the downside. And again, we saw that with social media. You know, social media is a really good analog to always go back to because it has really positive things that it can do and has done. And yet we weren't prepared for the downside and we didn't recognize it fast enough. And the downsides aren't because of the technology, it's because of the business models. So business models emerged around social media that drove the large platforms to become very good at tracking, profiling, and influencing people. That's their business. I don't think those companies are evil. I don't think that they had a master plan to go in that direction. I think that it's everybody's responsibility. Consumers didn't want to pay for subscriptions. Consumers didn't want to pay in other methods. Consumers were very happy to say, hey, give me free access to your platform, and then at advertised to me. And they just didn't appreciate what that really meant. And so it created a world where large platforms began to compete with each other to see who could who can sell the most persuasive advertising mechanisms to sponsors. And so they competed with each other to become better and better at tracking, better at profiling, better at serving news feeds that would capture users' attention and segment them even more. And so you ended up in this world where nobody had planned it. The social media companies aren't evil, but they created a world where their product has driven polarization and extremism and misinformation and disinformation. And so the first thing we could all do is just recognize that happened and realize that could happen again with the metaverse and it will be much worse for all the reasons that we've talked about. And so it's up to consumers and business leaders and regulators to all say, okay, let's try to avoid going down that path. And so what can consumers do? Consumers can demand a safe metaverse. Consumers can pressure the platforms to not uh, track them and profile them and influence them in the ways that we've seen from social media. And I think that would make a big difference. I think a consumer should be open to other business models, not just straight advertising business models. At the same time, the platform should be open to other business models, not straight advertising. I think that will help. I'm not under the illusion that even in that scenario, that platforms won't start going in that direction. We've already seen the first major metaverse platform announced that they're going for immersive advertising, and that's Roblox. And so in Roblox, it's a metaverse for kids, 50 million kids. And again, they're not an evil company. They try very hard to protect kids. But because of economic pressures, they've announced that starting next year, they were going to, they're going to shift towards immersive advertising. And I suspect that they will go in that direction and try to be responsible. But the way these industries evolve is that they'll have a competitor who's doing the same thing and will make slightly more aggressive advertising that appeals more to advertisers. And there'll be an arms race and it can go to very dangerous forms of advertising that, that go from marketing to manipulation, unless there's regulation. And so ultimately, I believe that there needs to be guardrails in place that, that prevent platforms from exploiting consumers through this general process of tracking and profiling and targeting. It, there needs to be some limits on what can be tracked, even more limits on what can be stored to generate profiles, behavioral profiles and emotional profiles, and then very clear limits on how immersive experiences are injected into the world promotionally, what's allowed in terms of a, a targeted promotional experience in the metaverse, so there should be very specific controls on that, and regulators should think very seriously about doing it. And, and one thing that's worth saying is, and I know a lot of people have skepticism that will regulators be able to actually do anything. And one of the common refrains you hear is, well, you know, regulators are still trying to figure out how to solve social media and the problems of social media and rein that back in. You know, how are they going to address the metaverse? And my answer to that is it, fixing social media is really, really difficult because we waited too long, uh, at least like a decade too long, to actually focus on the potential problems. The business models are deeply entrenched. Massive corporations rely on those business models. Very hard to force them to change. The metaverse, the business models have not evolved yet. The business models are in flux. The industry is in flux. Now is actually the best time for regulators to put some sensible guardrails in place. 
it will not hurt the industry at all. In fact, it will help the industry because they won't have to go down this arms race of competing to see who will be the best at injecting persuasive, immersive advertising into the metaverse that can read your blood pressure and your facial expressions and adapt in real time. They won't have to go in that direction because they won't be in an arms race if there's guardrails that say, you know what, you can't do that. And then they can compete on making the metaverse the most attractive and interesting and creative place for consumers. And so I don't think that regulation is a dirty word, especially when it happens early before business models have been established. It can actually help the industry focus on the things that they care about, which is making a cool metaverse, not on competing to create the most persuasive forms of advertising that are possible. Okay, there's a lot to unpack. First of all, I would say that this is an invitation. I think you and I and maybe other people should actually work on a framework for developing a safe metaverse, a meaningful metaverse. And how can that framework guide corporations, including the one I'm building, including the one you're building and others? And also, how can it guide the regulator or the politicians? And this is where I think it's, things get a bit tricky. In an ideal world, I agree with you. Consumers should vote with their, with their fingers. However, and I think that the internet has proven so far, people seek comfort. They seek easy solution or simple solutions that don't require them to think too much, which is why the second wave of the internet became so mass consumable because Google and Apple and Facebook really made it easy to use the internet. And this is why they've been so successful. Amazon, one click purchase, right? This is exactly why these companies became half a trillion to $4 trillion companies over the last decade is because they've made the internet mass consumable to the entire population of the world or majority of the world population. So that's one thing which is challenging, which I think human behavior will likely not shift. It reminds me back in the day, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago when everyone were like, okay, green product is the future right? Because everyone cares about climate change and they're going to buy green products, even if it's more expensive. And then Thomas Friedman came with the New York Times piece and he wrote, we're not having a green revolution. We're having a green party, right? Everyone is just kind of, you know, partying, but we're not really in a revolution. And I think I don't expect, and I'm just being pragmatic here. I don't expect that there's going to be riots or disagreements at large scale that people, that companies are mistreating our information because I think it's just common sense that people will still seek comfort, low cost, they would want to access things. And they're always going to be a fraction of the world population that is willing to pay for more safe or meaningful solutions that do not track their eyes, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thing. The second thing that I think is challenging is let's take Congress. I've recently read an article from Professor Scott Galloway where he talked about the fact that the average age of a congressperson is 62 years old. And the average age of the United States population is about 38 or 39. And so you have a whole layer of decision makers and policymakers and lawmakers in the United States who are older by at least two and two and a half decades than the average person in the United States. And let alone they haven't yet figured out how to deal with technologies like the iPhone, the iPad, and social media. This is a whole different level of complexity. And when you bundle that with other incredible technologies like artificial intelligence, which you're very close to gen genetic engineering and CRISPR and the ability to edit our own genome, and then you add the whole virtual realm. And on top of that, if we want to add the cherry on the already very delicious cake, let's add space because that's another frontier of human endeavor, which we're going to have to figure out how do we not mess it up. And so it just feels like we're not really going in the direction of a regulator that is able to deal with the challenges that technologies provide. And so my question, and I don't think you're going to come up with an answer at this point, <laughs> and this is why I'm inviting you to let's, how, what do we, how do we approach it? Because I am truly concerned that the metaverse that is gradually emerging every day, consistently being built every hour, every day, every month, every year now is going to be quite a dystopian place. And for me, dystopian means that it's not that the world is being ruined, is that we are really losing the very nature of what it means to be human and how technology companies are taking advantage of the proliferation of these technologies to really control our lives for lack of a better description. And here is the scariest part, that even the democracy as a political system is not untouched. Imagine a world where the metaverse 
is actually controlled by a political system that looks a bit more like China than what the United States used to be only a decade ago, right? And so that adds a whole new layer of dystopianism, I would say, that is not really in our control because we just don't know how political system will evolve in the future. And so to summarize kind of my point is, it seems like part of the challenge is really that the companies themselves need to be part of the solution. It's not only going to be about the regulator and it's not only going to be about the people. I think both of those entities, quote unquote, will contribute to what the metaverse can become. But ultimately, the people who really are shaping what the metaverse will become are people like you and I, entrepreneurs, creators, designers, artists, business people, engineers. And I think this is where the secret lies, which is the companies need to be at the forefront of that. But I think you've outlined the challenge, which is there's always going to be competitive pressure. I am very much in belief that Roblox is a really authentically want to build a safe metaverse. And I even interviewed on the podcast, VP Trust and Civility, Tammy Bomek from Roblox, who oversee trust, civility, and safety on the platform. And they do have the right intention. But what happens when those right intentions are being pressured by quarterly analyst reviews, et cetera, et cetera, profitability that is not enough for shareholders, et cetera. And I think that's a big part of what you're touching upon. I fully agree with everything that you said. And there's a big role for the corporations and companies, big and small, to push for a safe metaverse. There's a big role for developers inside of those companies to push for a safe metaverse. There's a role for consumers. And I agree with you that it's, in some sense, wishful thinking that consumers will reject an advertising business model, just as we've seen, we've seen that not happen in the past. That said, I do think that consumers are becoming more savvy because they've seen what's happened with social media. And I think that we are in a better place in terms of society appreciating that social media did not go the way that we all expected. And I think the same goes for politicians. Politicians very much realize that something went wrong in the world of social media. And they realize they don't want to make that mistake again. I also agree that it's a challenge. Most of the people are not technically savvy, but I think they do recognize that it's important to get out there early. I'm involved with a number of organizations that push hard to do a number of things, to educate uh, politicians and educate policymakers about the risks. Because that's really the first step is for them to appreciate the risks. The second is for them to appreciate that the metaverse is not far away. It's really happening. It's going to emerge. And to just realize that they can't wait for addressing things like social media because things continue to move faster and faster. The dangers will emerge quicker in the metaverse than they did for social media just because technology is evolving faster. It will take responsible people on all fronts to people inside of corporations, responsible developers, responsible politicians, responsible policymakers to say, we all want the metaverse to be this magical place. And one of the reasons that I've been promoting it for over three decades, it's not the technology itself that is inherently anything dangerous about. It's the business models and it's the ecosystems that evolve around the metaverse. And so the people who care the most, who believe in it the most should be the loudest about saying, let's make sure that it goes in a positive direction. And the message that I give to policymakers and business leaders is that once it goes in a negative direction and it loses trust, that hurts everybody. It hurts the whole industry. I mean, just look at social media. Their reputation of large platforms were really, really high and are now very low. Trust among consumers was really, really, really low. There was a study by Pew Research came out last year that said that the majority of Americans, I think like 66%, believe that social media is making the world a worse place. I mean, nobody wants to make a product where the majority of people think that it makes the world a worse place. We can avoid that for the metaverse. We can avoid that by being responsible now. And I think one of the best things that could happen is if large platforms realize that industry, that, that regulation is not a dirty word. Regulation at this time in the evolution, before business models have developed, regulation could actually help them focus on the things they want to focus on and not get into an arms race to become the ultimate tools of persuasion, because that's where it will go. The business model of selling persuasion is very lucrative and it's what, you know, took social media down a 
dark path, the metaverse will go down that path or the metaverse could go in a completely different direction. It's up to the companies and policymakers to just put really simple guardrails in place, simple guardrails that will prevent this industry from losing trust. The thing is, in the metaverse, one of the challenges is a lot of these technologies have, have good and bad applications. One of the things that's getting a lot of press right now is that headsets now can track your facial expressions. And there's been a lot of bad press coming out saying how it's a privacy violation, why are they doing this? What people don't often fight for is the opposite side, which is you can argue in a very rational way that adding facial expressions, tracking, is going to make the metaverse a more human place. It's a humanizing technology. It will allow avatars to, to look like people. It will allow ex interactions where people can essentially be like you're having real face-to-face -face exchange. Consumers will want that, but as soon as they lose trust and they think, if the first time an advertiser is using facial expressions to adapt an advertisement in real time to your emotions, people will turn away from that. They will say, oh, I don't want to be manipulated. If, if, and so if there's guardrails in place to say we can't go in that direction, we can now take advantage of all, all the really positive uses of what is a powerful technology, but preserve trust. So I think if we try to find common ground among regulators, industry, consumers, I think it should be preserving trust. And we should look at what happened with social media as what happens when when there's not guardrails in place because companies get forced to compete and whoever's first to start, whoever's the first to use blood pressure in real time in advertising is going to force other people to match them. It's just, that's just what happens. At the end of the day, it's really about finding the balance between how do we build a metaverse that is safe? How do we build a metaverse that is trustworthy? And how do we build a metaverse that is meaningful, right? So it can still be fun and engaging and exciting and prosperous with all the opportunities that we envision for immersive virtual worlds and what it provides to you people, to individuals, to businesses, to art, et cetera, but doing it in a way that will not harm further individuals or all of us as a collective. I think that's the real challenge. That's the real challenge. And like any system, there is no perfect system, even democracy, right? It's not a perfect political system. It's as someone, I don't remember the philosopher who said, the name of the philosopher who said, democracy is not the best, it's the least worst, right? And so how do we build an internet, an immersive internet that is connected to real life, that is may not be perfect, but it's definitely meaningful and safe and trustworthy. And I think finding that, striking that balance in my mind is going to be a key success factor in avoiding some of the dangers that you've described, Louis. I'd love to ask you a finale question. What's the one thing you want the listeners to take away from the conversation? I think the one thing really is that because the power of the metaverse is the ability to create these remarkable worlds where we can adjust everything around you and create magically artistic and creative environments. And that's a plus, but we have to think of how could those same exact capabilities be abused and misused. And at the highest level, without some guardrails, the metaverse could be a place where a third party can track everything that you do and then manipulate the world around you for promotional purposes. And it could be done in a way where you can't tell the difference between what's an injected promotional experience or some authentic encounter with other people in that world. And very simple guardrails could protect the public. In the guardrail that I talk about the most is if, if you say that there was one basic right that people should have in the metaverse, I think it's the right to authentic experiences. And by that, I mean, if I'm walking down the street in the metaverse and I see something, a new car, or I overhear a conversation, I should have the right to know, is that really a genuine serendipitous encounter that some other user parked that car there, that conversation is really other users, or is that a targeted advertisement that was put there to influence me? If I can at least tell the difference between those two things, then we take a major step back from manipulation to just marketing. Mark, I mean, 
marketing is not evil. What's evil is when it becomes deception and manipulation. And the metaverse, because it's the whole point of virtual reality and augmented reality is to blur the boundaries between what's real and what's not real. It, guardrails are more important than any other medium that advertisers had a, have had access to before. And if at the most simplest level, they just have to inform you, <laughs> you have to be informed. If I'm engaged in a promotional conversation with, with an AI driven avatar, if that avatar looks different than everybody else, so I know that I'm engaged in a promotional experience, then at least I can bring the same skepticism to an advertisement that I see on TV or a billboard that I pass. But if the boundaries are blurred and I cannot tell the difference, then the ability for manip manipulation is too extreme. Luis, thank you for a really phenomenal, fascinating conversation and to be continued because this topic will only grow in importance as the metaverse emerges to really be the next frontier of the internet. So thank you so much for being on the show with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a really interesting conversation. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Into the Metaverse. We hope you learned a lot and explored new aspects of the metaverse. 